I'm going to go ahead and dive into our second presentation. Leandro Naki Braga is an agroecologist, urban designer, and the founder of Geomanagement Permaculture, <coughs> a for purpose environmental design and advocacy business that organizes communities towards climate adaptation through watershed restoration, food sovereignty, and social housing. In addition to providing a crowdfunding platform for the support of permaculture-based initiative, Geomancer advocates for improved environmental policies in local government while working with visionary clients to develop engaging and functional land management solutions. So give Namji a round of applause. So I really want to commend them for opening up uh, that opportunity for me, and also want to thank uh, Judith Humble from Bluegrass, excuse me, Bluegrass Climate Action Team, who I think played a really large role in making that connection, uh, reaching out to people and saying, "Hey, listen to what this guy has to say. I hope that some of what I'm going to say here today is uh, going to be similarly inspiring to you, and be things that you want to take back to your family, to your community, and maybe some ways that you haven't." thought about uh, some of these topics before. So the title of the talk, The New Water Paradigm, How Repairing the Water Cycle is Key to Climate Adaptation. So I'm going to be speaking pretty specifically about climate change, global warming, however you want to conceptualize that. And I'm going to be speaking about the water cycle. Um, and, and so there's a lot there, and we'll, we'll break it down. Why do we need a new paradigm? What's the current paradigm? What's so important about water? I'll start talking about water because I think uh, it's something we can all kind of relate to. Right? Um, for whatever reason, we are missing this slide. There it is now. Um, so I love water. A lot of my career revolves around water, talking about water, teaching people about water. I myself am primarily composed of water. I think that's true of, of all of you as well. Um, a lot of the work that I do with ecological design is interpreting the landscape and reading energy flows through the landscape. And these can be some extraordinarily subtle things like soil fertility, topography, the way our bodies move and how we and wild animals want to traverse across the landscape. But water is one of those things. Water is like energy crystallized into material form. We can all see it. We can all agree that we're looking at the same thing. We can see how it moves through a system, how it flows across the landscape. We can learn about it together. We can talk about it together, develop a vocabulary about those fluid dynamics. And once you start understanding that kind of stuff, you can start talking about some of the even more subtle aspects of the landscape. So for instance, I have water in me, you have water in you, we all living systems have water. That's the same water, right? So those molecules that I sweat out probably get back into you at some point when you drink it, right? It might be a really long water cycle, but again, in an actual material sense, Water is a way that we can think about the fact that we're all interconnected. We are all the same being on some level, right? Water is one of those things that brings us together. And so it's a very potent topic to be exploring and to gather around. And actually, the physics of it are pretty interesting as well. Um, I don't know if this is going to keep happening or if it's just taking a moment to load my exceptionally high resolution images. But, um, you know. This is the blue planet, right? Water is life. When NASA goes out and they look into space and they're trying to figure out, is there life on some other planet? What are they looking for? Water, it's simple, right? It's the primary indicator of everything that we know of as life. Every process on the Earth is, you know, ultimately it's fueled by solar radiation, that energy source, the sun that, that's pumping uh, into this closed system that we have, a relatively closed system. Uh, but water is what's mediating every process. So come back to that. If, if you take anything away from this talk as I go through these slides, if I get too complicated with anything, the science, just think water is life. Anytime I talk about water, it's life. He's talking about life. All right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep the science, we're, we're going to keep it super basic. Uh, but I'm going to talk about water maybe in some ways that you haven't heard before, especially with regards to climate change. And as much as possible, I'm going to 
to try to make this intuitive. So I'm not talking about numbers necessarily. I'm talking about things that you yourself can see and experience in your daily life. But just remember, water is life. And so here again, we're having uh, just parts of the, the slides coming up. But this, uh, you're all Grow Smart Academy folks, so you recognize this. This is Lexington's comprehensive plan that's currently uh, under review, we're about done with, and, and all that. Um, and here in theme B, protecting the environment, we have goal two, identify and mitigate local impacts of climate change by tracking and reducing Lexington Fayette County's carbon footprint, greenhouse gas emissions, blah, 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 committing to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Yeah, we're right. This is a big deal, right? Because this is the first time that we have climate change language in our comprehensive plan. But when I talk about we need a new paradigm, this is exactly it. Because look at this. There's no mention of water. There's no mention of anything except greenhouse gas emissions, carbon specifically. Now, kudos to the planning staff. They've been able to sneak in some different things uh, in the policies and procedures that come out of the goals and objectives, the high-level piece of the comprehensive plan. But you talk to 90% of people about climate change, and they think carbon, reducing emissions, how do we get more energy efficient, things like that. They're not thinking about the water cycle. And we see this literally in our public policy. This is a very low level of sophistication in terms of long-term visionary leadership for land use planning in Fayette County. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about why that is. I'm gonna keep having to jump back and forth. Why that paradigm exists? Why are we stuck in it? Anybody recognize this graph? I cut the, the title off it to make it part. Anybody, anybody? No. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the Mauna Loa graph, or uh, Professor Charles Keeling's uh, Keeling curve, the famous readings of atmospheric concentrations of CO2 starting in the late 50s. They noticed, hey, this is going up. I wonder what that's about, right? And uh, the thing about CO2 is that it's pretty easy to measure. It's, a, it's actually pretty easy to quantify. And as a result, it's easy to financialize. It's easy to stick into a spreadsheet. It's easy to say, here it is, we got it in a box, we accounted for everything. Uh, and it's hard to do that with certain other things, right? Um, but there's, there's some interesting stuff in here, just in that, look at this seasonal variation. We see year after year, carbon spikes, uh, carbon concentrations spike when we are in the northern hemisphere's winter, and then they drop when all of our deciduous trees leaf out, photosynthesize, and start drawing that carbon down. So that's actually kind of irrelevant to the rest of my talk, but you can just see in this mechanism, we have a natural process in our land use, in our forested cover, that is able to regulate carbon to a pretty, pretty large degree. And then of course, it is our anthropogenic activities that have put us out of balance and make it so that we are increasing concentrations, right? But again, this is the, the paradigm that we're all stuck in is this Mauna Loa graph. And the reason for that is that in the 1970s, when the, this data was really building up and we finally had, the, especially the Carter administration was interested in some sort of environmental policy, long-term climate planning, they said, what, what can we do, what should we pay attention to? And they said, we should pay attention to this because water's too complicated. We actually, we can't, we couldn't possibly do, we, we couldn't be impacting the water cycle, that's crazy. And I can kind of understand why they would think that, right? Because the water cycle is crazy. And, that, and that, that should be intuitive to all of us because we've all been frustrated at some point or another with some sort of meteorologist who couldn't even get it right like three days from now, right? I mean, this is insane. When you think about all the different strata of the atmosphere, all the soil processes, all the ocean currents, everything that's happening at different rates, all at the same time, seasonal variations. Back in the 70s, they didn't have the, the computer processing power to model this accurately. We still don't have it today. So they said, this is, this is too big of a deal. And in fact, this is not new stuff. This shouldn't be like a, a controversial opinion that I'm that I'm talking to you about, because we've known, hydroclimatologists have known since the beginning of climate science that the hydrologic cycle was the key driver of the thermal regulation of the biosphere. The heat dynamics of the blue planet, right, are driven by water. Like 90% of the heat dynamics. 
That's crazy, right? It sounds crazy. But if you think about it, it's really not that wild because water is the only commonly available substance on Earth that you and I in our everyday lives might see in all of the primary states of matter, right? You might see some frost in the morning, and then you watch it melt, and the sun comes out, and then what does it do? It evaporates. That's nuts. We can watch water have to do that several times over the course of one day just in our one area of the Earth, right? And so what's happening in each of those phase transitions? Heat flux, energy flux, right? This is, it's cooling down, it's heating up. This is a lot, and it's happening all over the world, again, all these different scales, and it cannot be measured, it cannot be stuck into a financial spreadsheet and explained in those terms, and it governs 90% of the heat dynamics of the Earth. And so they said, we just can't deal with this. We couldn't possibly be impacting this because it's too large of a process. So let's just say it's zero and let's focus on the carbon, all right? So that's how we've gotten into, and, and this is what's basically driven climate science and climate discourse for the last several decades is carbon, 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 when we should be talking about this, because this is really where the juice is for me. And, and let me ask you, do you guys think, is, is this hypothesis of theirs they say, no, we, we haven't impacted, as a human global civilization, we haven't impacted the water cycle, don't worry about it. No, of course not. It's not true globally, and it's not true uh, just here. I've never used PowerPoint in my life, so I don't know what it's saying. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's not true here in Kentucky either. So this graphic, my favorite map of all time, I use it in probably every presentation I give because it's relevant over and over and over again. On the top, you have an artist's depiction of the natural physiographic kind of condition of Kentucky prior to colonization uh, by Western settlers. And then on the bottom, you have what it looks like now. So the two things that I really want to point out, on the top, we have a bunch of yellow, right? Those are our wetlands. Think about all the beavers that were running across this landscape and the rest of North America, for that matter, and all of the ecological function that's embedded in those wetlands, the carbon sequestration, the cooling and purifying of the water, the habitat, for crying out loud, right? All these things that Dr. Phillips also just talked about. Uh, thank you for setting me up so well, by the way, with your talk. Um, and then let's, uh, let's shoot down here to the modern. We're gonna see where's the yellow, it's gone. We have extirpated that landscape type from the area, we have removed all of the ecological function that that was providing. This is actually happening on a landscape scale. We've done it. We've done it over the course of centuries, so it doesn't look like, we don't notice what's happening, but it's happening. And then on top of that, we also have the red, right? The red is urbanization. It's our impervious surface areas. It's our heat island effects. It's all that kind of nasty stuff. And lest we forget, the loss of the native kind of patchwork mosaic of bluegrass woodlands being replaced with European pasture systems, that is also destructive to the functioning ecology of our region. So, look, just a little more detail. I, know, I think you all get this, but the water cycle, right? Generally how we learn it in school, water evaporates off large bodies of water, condenses up high in the atmosphere, falls as rain, and then works its way down again and through the soil is really the key piece of this. Remember again, water is life. So this is life moving through here. If we have life in the soil, it's because there's water in that soil. The microbial activity in the soil, the capacity for our vegetation to get into that soil. Uh, and of course, this is, this is oversimplified because it's not just one cycle, right? We have many, many little cycles through there. And the more vegetative cover, the more wetlands, the more grasslands that we have performing that evapotransferative function, the more we can cycle that water, the more we can cycle that life and hold it in the landscape. So the more uh, ecological vibrance, if you want, uh, we see in these landscapes. Then what happens when we urbanize, right? We cut off that evapotranspiration, we create heat island effects with all of these uh, these low albedo surfaces with thermal mass that just soak up heat like the asphalt. And of course, we stop all that infiltration. 
So all of a sudden, the groundwater is going down, and we're losing this. And when trees start losing, uh, when they start drying out, they don't just put their roots down deeper and search for the water, they die, right? So we are, uh, this, this is what we're seeing. We're definitely seeing people think about urban trees, what trees are gonna do well in compacted soils and things like that, and trees are great, and at the same time, if we're planting them into chronically dehydrated landscapes, they're never going to provide the ecological functions that we are telling people they're gonna provide, especially not long term, right? So this is, this is a process called the watershed death spiral, because as we lose that groundwater, the trees start dying. The trees, which are evapotranspiring the water that we get from the sky in the first place, it just gets worse and worse, right? And right now we're seeing this. This is the Amazon River, y'all, in my native Brazil. And this is what it looks like right now. Can you even imagine that? I mean, this is like on the scale of a continent. And people are saying, no, we couldn't be impacting the water cycle, no way. And this isn't even urbanization necessarily. This is conventional agriculture, slash and burn stuff, right? And so we think, we think, or at least some of us were taught, I was taught when I was a kid, that forests grow in areas where it rains a lot. And it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. It's dialectical, they rely on each other. It actually rains where there are forests because the forests are seeding the rain. And so as we cut the forest down, as we lose that uh, microbial community in the soils, we need capacity for those soils to retain water because of some of the, the things that the fungi and other microbes leave behind to give structure to that soil. This is what happens, the watershed death spot. So, let me just talk a little more in detail. This is where it gets super cool. Um, so, so the water can't infiltrate into the soil when we have the pervious surface areas, right? So we've cut that off. But when we do have nice natural vegetative cover that is capable of cycling this out, this is the most sophisticated system in the world. I can't think of anything cooler than this. It's fueled by the sun. So as far as we're concerned, there's no energy inputs, right? The sun's doing all of it. And then the water that's evaporating out of those leaves up top is pulling the water out of the soil just via capillary action through the stem of that tree. Each water molecule sticks to the next one and it just gets pulled up. So you don't have to plug this in, it just does it, right? No engineer is ever gonna come up with something better than this. Here's the best part. When that water, remember all the phase transitions, that energy flux that is carrying heat with it, when that water goes up into the atmosphere and it condenses again, it shoots that heat back out into space. Into space, y'all, like, like, I don't, I should have, like, this is the wrong place to put this in the presentation because I'm not going to say anything better than that. It's all downhill from here. Trees shoot heat back out into space. We have a global warming problem, and trees, for free, getting bigger all the time, doing better and better, shoot heat out into space. In addition to sequestering carbon and yada yada, and all we got to do is give them decent soils with enough water, and they will just do that. Okay. Um, a little more detail of how that happens, because I know, I know it sounds like fantastic and just absurd, right? So here at the Earth's surface, we have what's called the boundary layer, which is just sort of like the atmospheric strata closest to the Earth's surface. And this is definitely where like all our emissions, all our pollution um, from, from your cars and stuff like that kind of hangs out in there, right? And so it's very thick, and it's, uh, it's smoggy, it's hazy, and heat just hangs out, and it's not a good place to be if you've ever been you know, downtown Lexington in the middle of the summer. What happens when, uh, when that water, <clears throat> excuse me, when that water evaporates, and it goes from a liquid water molecule to a gaseous water molecule, the heat, whatever you want to think of it, the energy, the watts, that is sucked out of the atmosphere, is sucked out of the environment by that, goes into the molecular bonds of that water. So the water was a little droplet, and now all of a sudden it's expanded into a gas, right? The atoms are excited, they're holding that heat, and that heat goes from sensible heat to what's called latent heat. It is stored in the molecular bonds of that gas, and we no longer have to deal with it. We don't have to feel it. And then the gas rises, and the gas rises, as we know, right? It's colder up top, uh, the air is thinner, and what happens to that gas? 
it condenses back down into water, potentially. Thank you so much. Um, it condenses back down, and when that happens, that heat leaves those molecular bonds and becomes sensible heat again, and it radiates out just you know, passively as a, as a function of thermodynamics. It's going to diffuse out through the atmosphere. Some of it's going to come back down. Some of it's going to bounce off the clouds, more water regulating the climate, of course. And some of it is going to be re-radiated out into space, which again is just the coolest thing in the world. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about that condensation, because it just keeps going. This, uh, I'm sorry if this is like a gross picture. Um, I, I think it's awesome. This is a, a, it, it's a micrograph of the underside of a leaf. And this is a stoma. This is one of the little gas exchange pores that you know, there's thousands and thousands of these on the underside of these leaves. And this is where the water vapor is escaping from. And because metabolically nothing is perfectly efficient, there's also, in addition to water, there's, there's also like uh, some metabolites in there, some, uh, some waste products from photosynthesis, some other things that are just kind of in solution in the tree. And so it's a nice little uh, microclimate, microhabitat for bacteria and various other kinds of uh, microorganisms, hygroscopic bacteria, things that stick to water, kind of colonize these areas. And you also get fungal spores, you get pollen, you get a number of things that are just associated with woodland systems. And they, when that water air, uh, you know, aerosolizes and goes up as a gas, they hitch a ride on them because they're just little bacteria, they're little single-celled organisms. And Aerobacter orogenes is, is probably the, the most famous one that Louis Pasteur uh, identified. And so they just hang out. And then they become our condensation nuclei. Because when water condenses to something, it needs a surface, right? Like that cold glass of water with all the droplets on it. So same deal with rain. At the center of every drop of rain that's ever fallen is a little speck of dust. Something that that water had to start adhering to. And in this case, it could be pollen. It could be these hygroscopic bacteria. It could be, um, it could be fungal spores. And compared to something like uh, clay particles <coughs> from a, a dust bowl kind of situation, these hygroscopic microorganisms are going to allow for cloud nucleation, for the formation of rain. And so here, physically, this is how it's happening. Forest trees are creating rain. And so, again, this, this idea of the biotic pump, that as water evapotranspires out of the, uh, the forest canopy, and it rises and it condenses, that creates an area of low pressure that's sucking air in from elsewhere, whether it be over the seas, or you know, in our case, we're, we're an inland, landlocked state, so we need our moisture to come from somewhere else, and this is what's bringing it. So, it, it really, it's hard to even know where to stop talking about this stuff, because the water is moving through every process of this system, the trees, the plant life is mediating what's happening, um, the, where we don't have forest cover, this air doesn't slow down enough for that rain to nucleate. So some of those big windstorms that we're having that are just going to get worse and worse every spring. If we reforest the landscape, it's going to slow some of that down, allow that air to stay here. The water in the atmosphere stays exactly the same. It's going to fall somewhere, but instead of falling a little bit here, a little bit there, it falls somewhere all at once. Have you guys noticed that? The, the, just the change in the last 10, 15 years in, say, summer convective storms or afternoon storms. You used to be able to just set your watch by, I'm gonna sit on my buddy's porch in, in the afternoon in the summer and there's gonna be a big rainstorm. And now they predict it, but by the time the afternoon comes, what's happened? We have a high pressure heat dome that's formed over Lexington because of our urban heat island effect. And this nice cool air with moisture can't penetrate it. And so we're losing those storms. And when we do get those storms, it's that red squall line, that thin, intense piece that just moves across the landscape. I mean, that's just not even in my, my entire life, just in the last few years, that I, as a random person, have been able to notice this. I'm not you know, a, a farmer tied into the, the, the whims of the seasons or anything like that. It's just obvious. And hopefully it's obvious to you guys, too, because this is something that you can talk to your neighbors about and be like, yeah, that is different, and it is water. And we only have five minutes left. My goodness. So, so, so that's the big takeaway point. 
90% or more of the heat dynamics of the planet driven by water. And maybe four to seven percent driven by the carbon cycle. The latest research that we have right now is that the energy imbalance in, on the Earth is about three watts per square meter. That's, that's how, it's only like one percent. One percent of the solar radiation that we are receiving is getting trapped uh, above our homeostasis budget. And it's just building up and building up and building up. So we only need to fix one percent, potentially, of the heat dynamics of the Earth. What do you think is easier? Making that shift uh, in a system and the hydrology that controls 90% of those heat dynamics or making a shift in the carbon budget that only controls 4% of it and is also the basis of an, our entire civilization that nobody wants to change, right? <laughs> right. So, um, so we're trying to do a lot of things. You best believe, you know, we were uh, trying to get that change in the comprehensive plan. Say, so put the word evapotranspiration in this document. Put the word infiltration in this document. We lost that fight, but we're still pushing for all kinds of things. I'll show you some of the other things uh, that we do as a company. This is uh, Wellington Park. Several years ago, they, uh, they expanded Claysville Road, and as they do, they basically just took all the extra stormwater from that road and dumped it into the park. So this is just a straight pipe all the way uphill, and you know all the soil uh, between the road and the pipe is not getting that water, it's getting desiccated, and then all that water is just collecting all the volume, all the pollutants in the runoff, everything is just getting dumped into this floodplain, and of course it's starting to cut down like a laser, like it will. So got the city to let us go in there with a little bobcat and some rocks, and we built a more natural kind of regenerative stormwater conveyance. And, and this isn't super difficult, um, but it's also very small. We need to be doing this times a thousand everywhere. And there's money to do this kind of stuff, but it's usually in the stream channels. Everybody wants to fix the stream channel. Uh, let's work on the riparian vegetative buffer. There's grants for that. We need to be upslope. We need to be doing this at the point of development. We need to be doing this everywhere, literally everywhere in the county. But it's so cool because you can come out here and you can see in the first pool, it's just scum and cigarette butts and algae and stuff. And then in the bottom pool, dragonflies, all kinds of cool flowers. It's really interesting. And that water is having the chance to soak into the soil to slow down. It's not going to capture the largest storm events, but even just some of our, our little guys that move through in the afternoons, we have an opportunity to store that water in the soil and plant a lot of trees. Okay, here's another one. This is Southland Park. This is 2020, and uh, this is uh, <coughs> south side of town on Hillendale Road. They were going to, or they had an expansion of the storm sewer system, and they said we need to do something with all this water. So all you need to know is an ugly picture, but all you need to know is that basically what the city proposed was let's dig a 12 foot deep pit right there, and we'll just have a moat detention basin. It'll be great. And this is like what this is what we normally do. This is what you know we develop right now. So maybe make just a, a little proposal for them to say, can we just do this instead, all right? And keep all the trees that are on site that are helping with the stormwater. We don't want to get rid of them. Keep some of the infrastructure. We don't have to destroy it. Spread out your basins and make the water take the longest possible route through the site. Create distinct ecologies throughout the site with different microclimates that can be used and appreciated as amenities for the community. And they looked at that, and, and then here's what they actually built, uh, which, as you can see, we have one, two, three, four. We have nested basins instead of just one giant pit. So I'm not going to take credit for this. My company had nothing to do with this, but we did send this stuff to the city and say, my goodness, like, can we have a little more imagination, right? And this is what we need. This is just a part, but the reason it's so tragic that the urban service boundary has been expanded in such a careless way is that no one can make a credible claim to me that we're not just going to dig a bunch of 12 foot pits everywhere, right? If you tell me that we're going to do this and this is what we're going to develop around and build housing around this, remember water is life. We want it moving through our systems as much as possible. If you can make a credible claim that that's what we're going to build, then okay, I can talk to you as a developer. Let's, let's see what we can do. Because yes, we do need housing. We need all these other things. Um, but make Tell me a story about how the future is going to be better than the past. That's what we're missing right now. And uh, where am I? Am I done now? Are we good? I have some questions. There's some questions. Let's. Uh, I mean, let's just go to the questions. I got. I was just going to talk about a couple other policy pieces that we've worked about. 
Uh, we've also planted this year the largest public food forest in Kentucky in a uh, municipal greenway that was just a flood buyout lot. So community organizing, making sure that when we build these pieces of infrastructure, they are actually uh, resources for the community and that people are going in there and experiencing them. That's the only way for these projects to be successful. Um, and I, I, do, I do just want to end with this, with this one thought. When we talked about some of the policy that we're working on and some of the things that we're pursuing, but I think really the big takeaway here with this uh, new water paradigm, a different way of talking about climate change, is that this is a narrative about, again, how the future can actually be better. This is, this is a coherent narrative, especially when I'm talking to a young person, I'm saying global climate change, and it seems like, oh, the whole capitalist economy needs to change, and yes, it does. And, and, but, but what are we, what, what am I gonna do as an individual, right? This, talking about water like this, shrinks the issue down to landscape scale and says, here's some practical things, get a shovel, we can start fixing Fayette County right now, and there will actually be impacts because, I don't know about you, but I think it's a lot nicer under a tree canopy in the summer, right, than downtown. So it's not, it's not an argument, like you can see very directly the impacts of your work. And, and I think that's the main thing, is again, that coherent narrative about how the future is gonna be better. That's what we need more than ever right now. Um, thank you. I'm glad to, to take the very much. So what we need to do is elect people who are 
representing a coherent movement that's not just in one district, but is all of Lexington, and we're saying, okay, here we go, we're gonna put together policies, we're gonna caucus together, everyone who's voting for us knows that they're not voting for this one person, they're voting for this movement, this organization, whatever it is, whatever it wants to be, that, I think, is something that's gonna get me off the couch and say, all right, I'm going to try this, let's do it. That's the strategy that I would, uh, that I would recommend at this point.